again, welcome all of you. I know most of you, but not all of you. Uh, my name is Claude Stray. I'm a professor here at the Corbell School and uh, direct the International <coughs> Programs in the Human Trafficking Clinic, and more importantly for tonight's event, the Center on Rights and Development Court, the sponsor of this event. Um, and I'd like to welcome all three of our panelists. Um, uh, the court has one of the oldest centers at the uh, Fort Bell School, going back to one of the Silver Graduate School of International Studies, started in 1988 when it began, and has devoted, as it might sound, on uh, the issue of rights development and, and research into uh, human rights and human rights uh, issues. Um, since 19, or since excuse me, 2008, uh, we began to shift our focus a little bit to uh, having some more clarity as to where we wanted to put our uh, energies, and we decided to devote ourselves to advancing the universal implementation of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the ICSCR. Um, and uh, this year, for instance, uh, you might have noticed that the focus is on education, so the Spring Symposium, which I think is what, our 14th, is that right, 14th year of the Spring Symposium, will focus in on the issues of rights education. Last year, we uh, worked on uh, and did some work on accessibility to water, water conflict and the rights of water. Before that, human rights in Latin America. Uh, we've done globalization of human rights and on uh, international human trafficking and forced labor um, and human rights. So uh, this evening is part and parcel of that process uh, of having a conversation about uh, the right to education, the issues of education. Um, and obviously the topic this evening is, I'm sure, one that is very close to uh, all your hearts because of uh, debt and currents uh, dealing with uh, acquiring um, the higher education and <coughs> many stories that have been out there as to whether or not uh, the academy is fulfilling its obligations, whether education is getting too expensive, although I think we do, and I don't know if the panel will, distinguish between the fact there's a difference between the uh, issues of cost of education in private universities versus public universities. Um, and, um, uh, and if that doesn't come up, um, I'll raise the issue of QA at a time. Um, uh, of course, there's lots of people out there with the rise. And now, I, last I heard of NPR, about 10% of folks working on higher education are using what we call now private education, the University of Phoenix model. Uh, and privatization in that area is. Uh, a uh, very controversial topic, anywhere from running basically education mills and, and get, handing out degrees to very sub substantive uh, programs that are being done by some of these institutions, whether students uh, are getting their money worth or getting into debt that wind up getting degrees that are not worth anything, or all the way to uh, is the, the money that we're paying, do we get a return on our investment? <coughs> Uh, and um, these even questions of whether the brick and mortar establishment of how we do education uh, is the way to go. There have been, you've seen some policy writers say we ought to be just handing out, people ought to be getting a series of certificates in particular specialized area because that's going to be better uh, in getting the job. So there is a lot of issues. As also, I have to say, as a member of the Faculty Senate of the University of Denver, um, we get reports on, on issues of budget here at the University of Denver and compare and contrast ourselves to other universities around the United States, anywhere from the cost of the education to the compensation for faculty, compensation for administration, administrators on a series of things, and quite frankly, the health of universities, the financial health of universities, as a crisis of the health of universities, at least as it's been expressed to us by our chancellor and our provost at, uh, at the uh, uh, Senate, faculty senate meetings. So these are all things that are uh, up in the air and being discussed. Um, and this panel is going to be addressing some very pertinent issues directly related to your involvement, financial involvement, and the return of that financial involvement. <coughs> so the format is going to be straight, pretty straightforward. Uh, I uh, have a, 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 a Kelly speak first. Uh, and he's got a more technical aspect to his uh, piece. And so what we decided to be easier to do is have kind of combined instead of all the questions at the end, we'll have a few questions in between, but also have more time at the end, depending on how much time is left, of course. Uh, so uh, that after he's done with us questions and then followed by Art, uh, and, uh, and then 
Madam Chair, so I'll let you uh, finish up with, uh, with your piece. When it's over, we'll be open also to generally do uh, Q and A. I hope, and I would remind you that if you could do your very best to actually ask questions rather than making rhetorical stances, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, or if some of you have gotten clever at figuring out how to couch a rhetorical uh, stance in the form of a question, we recognize that's an acceptable form of getting around the rules up to a point. Uh, and if you think I'm a nice guy, most of the time, in my role as moderator, I'm not. So I will cut you off if it turns into a, 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 a turns into a speech with a question mark that we hope is at the end of it. Okay, how's that? Is that okay for ground rules? <laughs> all right. Um, so, well, first of all, I'm glad you're a um, strict moderator because sometimes I need one. Um, yeah. I can go on on one page probably forever. So definitely, uh, let me know if uh, if uh, I'll put my clock on. Don't worry. Okay. okay. Um, I also wanted to mention that while I'm from Kansas City, we have a branch here in Denver. It's right on the 16th Street Mall. So I'm, I'm in Denver quite a bit. I've heard great things about the University of Denver. So I'm really happy to have been invited here. Um, so I hope that sometime when you're on the 16th Street Mall during the day that you'll be able to stop in and uh, uh, take a look at our museum. And um, we have a lot lot uh, to offer there that you, might, that you might find interesting. But Colorado is part of our district. It, Denver is every bit as much of our part of our district as Kansas City is. It just so happens our headquarters are, are located in Kansas City. Um, also wanted to mention a couple other things. One is uh, um, I had student loans. Uh, I went to a small private with Lawrence College before um, I ended up transferring to public university. But um, I had my share of student loans. Um, but, Lucky for me, I've paid them all. I've been in my career long enough to do that. But um, certainly understand what it's what it's like to, to hold that debt and have that burden. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say before I get started is um, uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't, as far as I know, have an official position on stealing like that issue. And so I'm not the one to be giving it if they do have one. So um, these are I did a research paper on this and um, these are the views of myself and <coughs> my two co-authors so they should be construed that way I and mean, uh, the some people in, in Washington the Federal Reserve they have different very different views than I do. You know not a day goes by that you know for students it's it's there's one way to look at it that the student loan program the debt is, is real because you might call debt I'm sure a lot of you do um, for in general, for most people out there in the United States, you know, there's not a day that goes by that they don't hear or read about the student loan crisis, you know, the crisis in quotation marks, in the uh, media, for example, or they'll hear a policymaker talking about it. And typically, the story runs like this: is there'll be some description of the enormous run up in student loan debt over the last several years, and I've got some numbers on that that I'm going to share with you, and it is enormous. And then that'll be followed by the anecdotes of some individual people who are in terrible shape, okay, where you feel like crying for them, okay? <laughs> but what I think, in my general, I was asking myself, um, how big an issue is the student loan um, issue? And what I was afraid is that What's really behind that? If we, if we get numbers on, sometimes total numbers don't mean a lot, and sometimes anecdotal stories don't mean a lot. So what I set out to do was um, to uh, to try to to do some research that would um, inform us to the true nature and the, the true scope of, of what the problem truly is for for uh, um, So I set out to kind of inform and frame the debate. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and this might be real popular, but my question is, is it a crisis? And my short answer is not as much as we, the country's old used to think it is. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not a crisis for individual people. And I'm not debating, for example, whether who should be paying for higher education, for example. I'm asking specifically, with student loan debt the way it is, is that, is that a big crisis for the U.S.? And my short answer is not so much. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the growth in student loan lending. 
Um, we're going to talk about the burden on students, capacity to repay, and delinquency. And then I want to talk about the fiscal impact because a lot of what you hear is about this huge burden that's on the government. And it turns out that there's not a big burden on the government from the state of Wyoming program. Um, the paper is available on the Kansas City web, says website. Um, I'll make this available to the court so that uh, you all can get that um, uh, web address. And um, the, our presentations are all available on the web as well. Um, the paper is going to go into much greater detail than I can do in 20 minutes. So um, I think that um, um, I, would, I would love for you to take an opportunity to take a look at that more closely. Um, first of all, this total amount of debt. If you just look at this chart, it's amazing how much debt is flying. Uh, this is in um, um, essentially billions. It's in trillions, but it's in billions of dollars. Um, in 2005, there was $374 billion in student loan debt outstanding. In uh, 2012, it was $904 billion. So in the last three years, actually, student loan debt outstanding has increased by 36%. So it's, um, it's very dramatic. And what makes it even more dramatic is that if you think about the fact that it's more than all the credit card debt combined, it's more than all the audit debt combined. And while this was occurring, while we had this gigantic increase in the amount of student loan debt outstanding, consumer households as a whole were actually repairing their household balance sheets. So if you look at from the peak of the recession, early in the recovery, until now, what's happened is households have started paying down the debt. Okay. So while student loan debt is going up, all other forms of consumer debt has dropped by about one and a half trillion dollars um, since the recession ended. So they're kind of moving in opposite directions. Uh, the uh, skyrocket has in debt has especially happened since the recession. If you look at this date, you can see that the uh, lines take a marked, a sharp uh, divergence up in around the 2007 to 2009 period that of course is during the recession. That's not real surprising. I bet there's some of you maybe who are in master's programs or PhD programs who may have done something else if there were more career opportunities out there and you decided to go to school and get more education because of that. That may not be the case for any of you, but that happens. Um, but there's other reasons for uh, growth in student loan um, debt uh, 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 recently as well, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, well, first of all, um, I'd say unsubsidized Stafford. That's one where the interest accumulates while you're holding the debt, but that in some sense is subsidized by the government as well. I won't go into the details by that, but when I say subsidized and unsubsidized, I'm talking about whether your interest accumulates. And you can see that the sharpest rise were in the uh, um, Stafford loans, the other federal or your Perkins loans, and your non-federal or your private loans, which have actually come down. Um, private loans are one of the um, types of loans we're most concerned about. I'll tell you in a minute why that might be the case, but they make up about 7% of all um, state loan debt outstanding, almost entirely government. So, so where is this debt increasing? That makes a big difference. Okay, why is the debt increasing? Well, it turns out that it's largely driven by enrollment. Okay. And to some degree, this mitigates my concern about the growth in student loan debt. So what I don't want to see happen is students just getting themselves into more and more debt than individual students. But the fact that it's driven largely by enrollment, that there are more people in college and in grad school, and therefore there are more people that are borrowing student loans, mitigates my concern a little bit. Um, there's uh, also a larger increase in the share of students who borrow. So not only more people enroll, but of all the people who enroll, the share of all those people who are borrowing money has increased. Okay, so it's mostly coming from numbers of people rather than average amounts of debt. It turns out that over the last couple of years, the average amount of borrowing has increased um, uh, moderately, but most of this increase in total debt is coming from the uh, increase in the number of people who are in the number of borrowers. Um, as I mentioned, I think the increase in enrollment is um, at least partly a function of the economy, but um, I, I think uh, it's part of a secular trend. 
also that more and more people go to college in for four-year programs. Um, that might not necessarily be a good thing by all measures, right? Because it's not. There's there's some other ways that people can get educated and trained for very very good jobs that don't involve going to four-year colleges. That's kind of aside from the, the point on, points I want to make today, but that's something to think about. Um, the increased share to our borrowing um, and the, the fact that the amounts that are borrowed has gone up a little bit, um, I think could be potentially um, related to uh, higher tuition. Tuition is going up dramatically. And I think that assistance on the part of state governments especially is going down uh, dramatically in some cases. Um, what I did go to a private liberal arts college, I live in South Carolina at the time, you can't tell from my accent. Um, and uh, they actually paid money for people to go to private school. So, I mean, there's none of that uh, anymore. Um, and, and it's hardly any aid, really, for uh, for uh, state uh, education compared to the way they used to be. So I think that um, explains some of the increase in the share of their borrowing and um, the, uh, um, there's that moderate growth we've seen in average payment. So you need to ask yourself, what's the issue that we're looking at? Um, this is what's happened. What do we need to be concerned about that? One of them is the borrower's capacity to repay and the burden on the borrower. And to me, the other is the fiscal burden on the government. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about. Now, first of all, it might surprise you that, um, and I was looking at everyone who holds student loan debt. So these could be people who have been paying off their debt for a long period of time. That was the purpose of this particular paper. I'm actually doing some work, some more dynamic work right now. I have more, I, I use data from Equifax. So I have a 5% sample of all the credit reports in the U.S. Um, it's all scrubs. I can't look up any of your credit reports, so don't worry about that. But what it does allow me is to collect all sorts of information on student loan debt that I couldn't get otherwise. Okay? And before, I only had a few years of data when I wrote this paper. Now I've got it going all the way back to 1992. So I'm expanding the paper, doing a little more dynamic analysis, and trying to see from year to year what happens to the typical student who's borrowing. So I think that's going to add a lot to the discussion. But for right now, um, there's a big difference between median and average. I know most of you know this, you've been in school for a long time, right? The median, you line everybody up according to the least debt, the most debt, take the middle person, that's the median. The average, you add everybody up, divide by the number of people, and that's your average debt. Turns out the uh, half, the median is less than $14,000, so half of people who owe student loan debt owe less than $14,000 half or more. Um, the average debt is 24000 Okay, so why is the average so much higher than the median? The reason is <coughs> the people at the far end with tons of debt. Okay, they're driving up that average well beyond, well beyond the median. 25% um, of people with debt have less than 6000 25% uh, have over 30000 uh, in debt. Um, there are three uh, slightly more than 3% of people with single loan debt who have over $100,000 in debt, and half a percent with over $200,000 in debt. Now, how do you accumulate $200,000 in debt? There are a lot of ways you can do that. I mean, I think it's hard. I think it's easy to accumulate $100,000 with kind of poor management, changing colleges all the time, and majors and things like that. $200,000, you're probably talking about people that went to medical school and, and, and things like that. So, um, in terms of payment, the median payment is $190 a month. Um, and uh, for 25% of people, it's less than $25. For 25% of people, it's greater than $382. Okay. I actually did a calculation that the average person coming out of school clears, or, um, clears about $2,500 a month. This is really back in the envelope type of stuff, okay? So uh, for them, a $382 payment is quite a, quite a burden, obviously. Um, uh, that accounts for about 25% of the people. But interestingly, 40% uh, of the people with student loan debt um, are um, under 30, but a third of them are over 40. Okay, so a lot of those people out there holding student loan debt didn't either, they got plus loans, 
there's a parent line for undergraduate statements, or if you're a grad student, you can borrow it. All my stuff limited now, so not even cross lining. Um, they uh, deferred or forbore their loans, or they uh, just went to school late or whatever. But there are actually a lot of people who have student loan debt who are over the, uh, the age that we might normally think of with, with uh, student loans. Um, so I guess my issue here is my consensus is that there's a group, a cohort of people who have very serious debt problems. I think we need to be very concerned about mm -hmm. them. I mean, I share their pain. I think um, uh, there's assistance that, that the government actually provides to try to help these people. I don't think the information that's out there is good, but I feel for those people, I think it's a big problem. My point here is that it's not as widespread as you might think just from reading the newspapers. Um, delinquencies are high, however, they're currently 11% are past due. But interestingly, of those, almost 9% are about ready to default. So there aren't that many people who are 30 and 60 days late. It's mostly people who are about ready to default. On the, the New York Fed uh, noted that 47% of the people who have student loan debt are either in school or deferment or forbearance which it, the delinquency rate then jumps for 27% for people who are in repayment. Okay, so those are astronomical delinquency rates. Um, those are something that I'm very concerned about. Um, I think there's some big implications for the future, and I think it's for the delinquent borrowers. The government tends to get that money back. Believe it or not, most of those people are gonna end up paying that money back, but it's gonna be a long slog, and they're gonna get uh, some severe consequences because of it. The U.S. government uh, has a very high uh, collection rate on student loan debt. Um, uh, cohort default rates, I'm going to skip over that. Um, just basically, this is people who, after they graduate the fiscal year, they defaulted by basically two years later. That's 9.1% currently. Lifetime uh, default rates, it depends a lot on what kind of loan it is, but for subsidized staffers, it's about 23%, which means sometime during your lifetime, you'll default on the, on the Stafford loan. That doesn't mean you never pay it back or won't start repaying, but it's sometimes you're, sometimes you're technically in, uh, in a default, which typically is 270 or more days late. Um, issues driving delinquency, I know I don't have much time to go over these. I think recession and recovery is a big part of that. I think um, um, I am going to look over kind of now that I have more data, I can see what delinquency rates would look like over time. But unemployment, underemployment. So uh, you might know a lot of people who you went to school with who uh, got degrees in engineering and they're delivering pizza. Okay. Uh, as far as the government is concerned, they have a job, they're employed, but um, that's not the kind of job that we want these people to have. So um, those people typically, a lot of times, will have trouble paying their loans. Um, wage and salary growth has been so low. Um, Non-completion is a huge issue. Only about 60% of people complete their degrees within six years. <coughs> There are so much better prospects for people who complete a degree. I think about it like buying an asset, like if you're buying a car. So if we're so worried, a lot of times people buy a $30,000 car, and we don't think anything about it. They spend $30,000 on student loan debt, and we're up in arms about it. And the fact is, is that for most people, if they complete their degree, that's probably going to be a worthwhile investment. Again, we can disagree on who should be responsible for paying for college education, but a $30,000 towards an education is going to be a much better investment than $30,000 towards a car. You have a longer period to pay off, and you have more options if you can't make payments like forbearance, deferment, um, extended payment periods, income-based repayment plans, and so on and so forth. Um, it turns out that uh, people with college degrees earn 66% more. Um, they, uh, the unemployment rate is less than 4% people with college degrees, and their default rate is 4% versus 17% for non-completers. So non-completers are a big part of this um, delinquency situation. Um, another issue driving delinquencies, there's no credit considerations. Nobody looked at your credit record when they gave you student 
way. Okay, we can we can ask ourselves whether we think they should or not, but that's that's part of the point of the problem. Okay, because people with a very poor credit risk who are getting money. <laughs> um, and then there's a lot of poor borrower information. That's changing. A lot of schools are starting to do a good job saying, this is what it's going to be like when you leave. This is how much you're going to have to pay back. This is what your life is going to be like when you're paying this money back. But before, there hasn't been enough information, good information there. Um, basically, I'll go through the fiscal impact in like one minute. Um, the federal government uses this an accrual base. So what they do is they make a loan in one year. They're all direct loans now. The federal government's lending directly. So what they'll do is they'll take the future stream of payments. So they'll take that loan amount they just gave you, plus they'll take the net present value of everything you pay back, plus they'll count for the likelihood that you're going to be delinquent of the loan, and that'll end up in this year's budget. Okay. And then over the time, as delinquency rates change, they might make adjustments for that. Okay. When they do that, um, they use what's called the uh, Federal Credit Reform Act uh, accounting. The go federal government actually profits from the student loan program. So uh, they earn more in interest and uh, so forth than they pay out in uh, losses in terms of delinquencies. So um, by their own accounting, in fiscal year 2013, the government's going to make their essentially profit by $32 billion from the student loan program. Okay, um, most accountants, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but think that that's, that, that particular way of accounting is uh, the best way of accounting. Uh, it's, uh, then what we want to use is what we call fair value accounting, and that can, accounts for more of the costs associated with collecting money and so on and so forth. In that case, student loans cost 11% in this first sense. In uh, 2013, that's about 0.4% of the U.S. budget. So don't let anybody tell you that student loan debt is uh, killing the uh, federal budget and killing the U.S. government. That's simply not the case. Um, there is isn't, hasn't been, at this point, much of a fiscal impact. Um, I'm not expecting to see huge increases in default rates. Um, uh, we could continue to see the rapid increases in borrowing, but um, uh, and some reform options could change everything, right? If we had loan forgiveness, for example, that I know that there's a lot of talk about that. That's going to entirely change the fiscal situation, obviously, right? But for right now, the way the student loan program is, the budget, it's not a big impact on the federal government. So there's my contact information. Feel free to write me or give me a call and yell at me or whatever you want. But, um, I'm happy to answer your questions if I can. So, following the format, we'll have to do two or three questions for in between and then say most of the questions for the ESO. Um, my biggest question is, why is it that the interest rate is so high for student loans and the interest rates for other things is so low? And there's no, there's, there doesn't seem to be a, anybody budging on that. Um, first of all, I, to be honest with you, I don't know exactly how they said that. I do think there's more credit risk associated with student loans. So there's a, a kind of a basic interest rate, essentially. You might call it a prime rate. Okay, that's this is a, when we know that um, it might be the rate on a treasury bill. Okay, the government's not never gonna they're not gonna default. It's the, the safest investment in the world. Whatever interest rate that is, that's the basic interest rate. And then you add that's the cost basic cost of money. And on top of that, you add the cost of risk that you're not gonna get paid back, and that's a credit risk. And I think there's a lot of credit risk associated with student loans. And I think that could be part of the reason. Um, but I don't know. I um, always wondered why um, I had some student loans when I was paying them off, and I consolidated them back when interest rates were pretty high, so I could consolidate them again. You know, so I was paying really high interest rates, and so I tried to pay them off really quickly, you know, doing things like this. But I don't always understand why things are the way they are. I do think there's a huge credit risk for steel loans. I think that partly explains because it, you know, they have to recover money from the people who are paying in order to compensate for all these people who aren't paying. It's not fair, but that's true with banks too, right? That's true with body loans and mortgage loans also. There's a credit risk premium associated with fixed interest rates. So I'm, I'm curious, do, do the universities have any skin in this game? I'm just not sure what, so if I come out of school and I default, 
that affect the University of Denver's book at all, or is it strictly between me and federal government? I think increasingly, and I'm, this is something I'm, I'm not as familiar with, but increasingly, yes. Okay. Um, uh, before, um, if, if I go to these cohort default rates, or um, look back in the 89 and 1990, how high they are. <laughs> There was some federal government action that was taken to make schools more responsible. For that, 1,400 schools lost their ability to uh, to uh, uh, offer essentially student loans, federally subsidized student loans. Um, that really made the cohort default rate drop off. And then uh, now we've got this problem with the uh, um, private for profit colleges. You know what the completion rate there is? 28%. Okay, and what happens too is you get a degree from some of these places, and I'm not, I don't want to make a blanket statement here about all of them, but in general, they're not going to be for what a degree from the University of Denver is. Okay, this is what some, when people, when employers look at that, they're going to say, University of Denver is a real school, and people go there and say, and then they look at some of these other places and they question. Some of them might be real good, no, I don't know. But they question how good an education people have gotten doing it online and all these different types of things. And um, um, those people default like you wouldn't believe. Okay? And so the federal government's really cracking down on this for profit. I think we'll see increasingly um, more government action to uh, make schools, old schools responsible for, for student land uh, default, um, more responsible for reporting. Uh, graduation rates, what people do after school, and that sort of thing. There may be somebody else who knows more about that than me, but I think you're going to see that increase. Uh, so, in, in, in essence, there's, uh, you know, um, while BU or any school doesn't isn't directly affected by the fact that you default on a loan, it is. It takes a longer time, but the, it comes home to roost in the sense that the, the, the federal government. Like it did when I was in school, this one happened. Yeah. Uh, uh, said, "Oh, you, uh, you're not managing your students or educating your students right." And so, uh, what we'll do is cut you, cut off your ability to give loans. Of course, makes it the ability to, to enroll in that school a bit more difficult. And it makes so a dramatic difference. Yeah, it made a dramatic difference. It did make, and, and people. And, and I have to say, that the attitude, quite frankly, among the students was. You can default, there's no consequences, right? So what are they going to do to me? So, and I can declare bankruptcy if nothing else. And when you have no money declaring bankruptcy, people don't think about the repercussions when you're uh, younger and you're 20 declaring bankruptcy. It means almost nothing. You have nothing, so declaring bankruptcy does so what? But in fact, it comes back to hurt actually the next generation of people <clears throat> trying to come into school and because that school doesn't get the loans. You raise an interesting point. Um, I talked about some of the options that are available out there. The, the government does make a pretty good effort to try to help people who can't pay their loans back. If you default on a student loan, it's horrendous. They, they, can, uh, they can take, you can forget about borrowing. It's going to ruin your credit score. You'll never get student aid of any kind. That, uh, like it, maybe, maybe if you make good on your loan, maybe it's possible down the road. You cannot bankrupt student loans. Okay? You can bankrupt your auto, you can bankrupt anything else. You cannot bankrupt your student loans. There are very limited cases where you can, and the law is very clear on this. It says that you have to have a hardship that shows that you can't pay your student loan back and that that's going to persist over the entire repayment period. And there are a lot of other conditions on top of that. So you're in a lot of trouble, right, if, if you can't uh, pay your student. They can, they can garnish your wages. They can intercept your tax refund. Uh, they can, there's a lot of power that the government has. And because of that, their collection rate is actually 109%. <laughs> they uh, collect more in fees and, and extra interest on student loans than they do than actual people not defaulting. If you include the cost associated with collection agencies and so forth, it's 88%. They, they get the money back. And the reason is they have a big hammer in order to get it back. Um, I was just wondering if you have an, an opinion on student loan fraud. Like I've read a lot of, and it kind of relates to the questions we've been talking about, but like 
for-profit universities enrolling students that likely don't have a good good prospects of completing their degrees or people enrolling simply to get the financial aid and not having you know is there any initiative I, to I, I definitely um, I think that's hard at least in the data I have and I, I don't know how it would be even hard for colleges to do I think financial aid offices to identify the type of fraud I definitely think it's out there I know a grad when I was in graduate school I know a guy who got a student loan on a car you know um, I mean, there, there's always people that are going to do that. And then um, I know that, I imagine that this, I mean, I'm almost certain it's true at, at the University of Denver, and I know it's true at most universities, that they only want students to come in that they think have a chance of succeeding. Right? They, they want that, I mean, to the extent that, um, I mean, maybe some of them want to just raise money, but for the most part, um, uh, kind of traditional universities, they want, they're, there's a, uh, uh, not everybody gets in for a reason. It's that they want to invite people in need to succeed. There's some question as to whether that's the case with for-profit universities, because they're, if, if they're completely profit motivated, then they can make their profits whether the students succeed or not, right? They're still paying money. And they're, they're, I'd say uh, 80 to 90% of their money comes from federal student loans. So, um, I, there's higher, is so is the government paying any attention to that? Yeah, I'm talking about that. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll let you yeah. know. Yeah. But, but yeah, there's fraud. I can answer that now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if you ask the question, what are the consequences for schools? And so the federal government instituted um, guidelines uh, that uh, programs can lose the ability to. Uh, Garner student aid for their students if uh, the new rules require that at least 35 percent of their former students are paying their loans, that their annual loan payments don't exceed 12 percent of their total earnings that the students are earning, and that those payments don't uh, total more than 30 percent of discretionary income. And those are known as the gainful employment rules. They're relatively new. Uh, school has to be in the uh, in default of those for three years before they move their ability to, to uh, collect um, federal funds. And, and there have been games being played on how to get around some of these rules. And you don't count as being in default if you're in deferment or forbearance. And so a lot of uh, the for-profit industry is guiding students into for-profit or forbearance, into deferment or forbearance uh, so that they don't count in default numbers. So why don't we move on, Art? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think I know everything good. Mm -hmm. I should. Um, I have a couple of handouts which we can pick up later on. Uh, one is a piece which was in Psychology Today called Student Debt as a Moral Issue. Thank you. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, student Debt as a Moral Issue. And one of uh, some statements by one of my favorite writers, Professor John Hopkins, um, which uh, deals with the problem of the uh, of student debt and administrators and what is going on. So here I have them up here and you can pick them up. I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can because uh, time is running on. Um, I think of a song when I think of student debt <clears throat> that you don't remember because you're not old enough. It was called, um, it had a line in it, and the line was, and the rich get richer and the poor get children. You can just say it from, from the rich get richer and the poor get dead, and you'll understand where I'm coming from. I will say controversial things about things that I've researched and which I have read a great deal about, and it will not simply be economics, but will deal with moral and social and psychological issues of indebtedness uh, on this. The university today is replicating a pattern which is very disturbing to me because it looks like wealth distribution in the United States. <clears throat> when I went to school, uh, my entire undergraduate education was $5,000. When I started at the University of Denver, which was thousands of years ago, admittedly, um, I was paid $5,500 a year to go to school. The uh, gap between faculty members and students and administrators was very small. You understand that, you know, what's been going on here. People have talked about this a lot in the last 
uh, election. Uh, the gap has grown enormously, and so we have people who are sitting at the top of the pyramid who made great deals of money, and students who are in debt. I don't know if anyone's actually done a, a, a book on this yet, but I would like to read it over time to see what has happened here, because it's very interesting, uh, about the wealth distribution in universities, uh, which parallels, in my view, wealth distribution in the United States. Um, this. Um, there was no student debt uh, when I went through school. I was poor. But I came up with those student debt because nobody ever heard of a student debt. It was as simple as that. I checked with uh, people I graduated with from the Fletcher School and asked any of them. Uh, and the answer was no. Uh, the average debt a few years ago at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy for a student was $60,000 a year. The provost at the University of uh, Fletcher School told us that, and I have no reason to doubt it. Gordon Gee at the Ohio State makes $2 million a year, right? That's the very top. Uh, but a lot of people are trying to close the gap. And at AU, right? <laughs> in terms of how this is working. And this, of course, leads to some issues beyond economics about wealth distribution in America, now representation in American universities. You with me so far? I'm going to say some very controversial things, but mainly to provoke you all into responding, if you will. The other part of the story is administrators have multiplied like rabbits, okay? Schools were run by very small numbers of administrators many years ago. Now, um, they are in great numbers, as um, one writer, Mr. Ginsburg, says, that we hear hosts of administrators and staffers are added to college and university payroll, even as schools claim to be battling uh, budget crises that are forcing them to reduce the size of full-time faculties. As a result, universities are filled with armies of functionaries, the vice presidents, associate vice presidents, assistant vice presidents, provosts, associate provosts, vice provosts, assistant provosts, deans, deanlets, and deanlings. I like the last one in particular because it reminds me of some sort of animal kingdom, you know, deanlets and deanlings. Each commanding staff is an assistant with more and more direct operations at every school. There's been a lot of people writing about this, and much of what is going on in terms of university expenses has to do with the rise of administrative elites. And so I've been trying to understand that um, argument and to follow it through. Uh, Mr. Ginsburg uh, has many other dark things to say about how universities are run uh, nowadays, but is concerned about the administrative class, which is really not connected to education at all. This has many consequences, one of which is money. Um, some headlines on student debt. I've been collecting them from all over uh, the country and from articles, and I'll just mention four of them, and then just quickly mention a movie I went to see this week, which reminded me uh, of this very much. Um, uh, uh, Darwin Von Graham says that you people out there who are in debt, which I assume some of you, are the coal miners of today. Wow, you know, and I hope some of you will end up having daughters who will be coal miners. Daughters on that one. Uh, Paul Krugman, who is a very well known liberal economist who writes in the New York Times, says you're in something called debt peonage, which I think the language is quite extraordinary when it's been coming out on this one. Uh, Leonard Casuto uh, calls you intellectual sharecroppers. I like that one. You know, I, mean, I haven't heard the word slave yet, but it's coming. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Williams wrote a wonderful, wonderful article in the AUP, which I passed on to some of my students, calls, uh, says you are indentured servants, except your position is worse than in colonial times because they could pay off their obligations in about seven years, right? You're not that lucky, you know, so uh, we have that. And you mentioned death horror stories, which I read with fascination, and I don't know uh, how to generalize from them, but the one I like the best uh, was what is happening in society at large with respect to seniors being trapped in their uh, in student debt, in their children's debt. That's called co-signing. I was on a jury once where I saw this in practice, where someone had foolishly co-signed a loan and was wiped out by the act of simply his signature. So I remember how frightening it was because we had no choice but to, in effect, honor the co-sign on that. Um, here's one that I just read. The early morning calls from debt collectors continued even after mass after after a massive stroke waking Bella Logan to daily reminders that she owed $75,000 in student loans. Logan well, is 94, it was not her loan, right? It was the loan that she is responsible for uh, simply because she co-signed loans for children and grandchildren. Thus, this is escalating into society in ways which are really, really worrying.
worrisome. And here I'm talking beyond economics, but at least you understand what troubles me. The only way to get out of debt, please correct me if I'm wrong, is if your child dies. So uh, as soon as I have some time, I'm going to write a book. It'll be a wonderful novel, and I've already uh, decided to sell it to Hollywood, and maybe Quentin Tarantino can make a, a movie about it with some parents, in effect, $150,000 obligated to their student uh, debt, and with this, another sick child killed with yeah. Uh, child, you know, because that's the only way to get out of debt is murder. <laughs> it seems to me to be a wonderful play, and I expect that I would get rich off it right now. Um, this is the only way you can avoid if you're a 94 year old person um, not being on the mean streets of Denver. I'm saying this with tongue in cheek, but I'm also serious. And when it happens and you see it in a headline, parent kills child to get themselves out of debt. Remember, you heard it here first, and I expect an email. <laughs> okay, why does this happen? What has happened from when I was younger? I remember I'm the oldest one here uh, by far. I've been teaching for over 50 years, and I forgive the person that said for me. I take pride now on how long I've been at the University of Denver. And I'll just mention some, and then focus on a couple of things that are significant, and then turn to what's the way up, because I think it needs massive systemic change. I don't think we can continue on this path. Something's got to give. And if we don't take it seriously, and take what I'm saying seriously, the price will be paid by everyone in this room right now. Okay. Uh, here it is. Cuts in state funding. This has been a disaster. Everybody knows it. Because states used to pick up more of the burden of your uh, education, and it's getting worse and worse. No doubt about that, right? And it probably uh, is not going to improve in the near future. Massive capital spending projects, right? I will not mention anything in the local environment. I want to speak in general terms. Um, but as colleges try to learn their students uh, by uh, state-of-the-art facilities, which is kind of a magic world, they build and build and build and build. Okay, and it may work in bringing students in, but the cost is enormous of what basically is like uh, the NBA, a stadium war, or football stadiums and things like that. And university universities are now following that model. I'm sure you must be aware of it. You don't have to go very far to understand that one. You know. So we have, in effect, a major problem with respect to competition in building. I've seen it here on this campus. When I came here, it was all part of us. It wasn't very pretty, but it was not part of us. Please laugh with me. You understand, we all know I'm a disciple of Percy George Carlin. Someone just gave me one of his records. You might as well laugh because there's no way else to do. <laughs> Dramatic in, increase in administrators. It's amazing, you know. Um, Mr. Uh, Ginsburg says that uh, generally speaking, I'm smoking so by the way, a, a, a man with a named professorship at Johns Hopkins. I'm not picking from the bottom of the pile on this. Mr. Ginsburg says, generally speaking, a million dollar president could be kidnapped by space aliens, and it would be weeks or even months before his or her absence from campus was noticed. This is very dark, uh, and you can get away with things like that. I don't know if I can. And Indeed, if the same space aliens also took all the wet, well paid needlets and needlings, their absence would also have little effect on the university. It would simply be assumed that they are all away on retreat. This is a very dark statement, right? And obviously, you have to, we have to look at this very carefully, but his position is very clear on this. Uh, we need to more good workers than bad adjuncts. You know, someone being paid 2,500 bucks a year and teaching you when we have great numbers of them um, on that actually do more for the educational process than overpaid administrators, of which we are. Okay, what else? Um, uh, this is this is another problem, and how to cut back on what we are spending right now. Um, I want to focus on something close to home to me personally, and again, I don't mean to say anything which would hurt anybody's feelings, um, but I am quite amazed at the fact that, as Mr. Sp uh, uh, Mr. Spencer in psychology uh, says, that this is a moral issue, and it's a moral issue for faculty members who don't talk about it. Right? We don't want to talk about student debt. I'm fearful of bringing it up uh, because I might get stoned to death. It would be some sort of a quote that would have uh, I won't go into my analogies on that one, but stoning would be a suitable punishment. But talking about student debt, right, which is like swearing in church um, about this, and I'm quite aware of this. I just keep my mouth shut. And the question is if it is a moral issue, as Mr. Spencer argues, uh, and faculty members who are being paid in large measure by student debt to understand we are being paid by your debt. 
then shouldn't we be talking about it in a moral way? And that means asking entirely different sets of questions than what occur in faculty meetings. Now, you may disagree with me, but I'm quoting from other people. I'm not coming in here armed with my own biases. I'll have plenty of those. <laughs> but I think this is very, very interesting. Um, he writes, a university is like a church. It requires money to exist well, but money should not be the only goal of its existence. I think that's wonderful, and it really uh, means that the faculty itself have to be brought in to, um, you don't like the word crisis, I'll use it anyway, into the crisis that is taking place among students and be on your side, and not just simply try to get you to spend your money, right? We have to be part of uh, all of this. Faculty members do not want to um, talk about uh, students any more than members of the Ancien Regime in France wanted to discuss, excuse me, the plight of the poor. They were upwardly mobile, but not socially conscious. And so we need to do this. We need to bring in morality and social consciousness into this problem for you. I hope you're following all of this because, in my view, it's not being done. And I'm not speaking of my colleagues, I'm speaking in general because I think this is a subject that all wants to talk about. Well, here is what he says on the end. This is Mr. Spanzer. I have his article here. You can read it. There's one writer that says, failure to take student debt seriously means the faculty is complicit by fatigue, by willful ignorance, by lazy habit, by self-deception, or by wickedness. That's extraordinary, you know, a claim against uh, academics who I find to be very nice people, by and large, with a few exceptions. And um, I, I find that to be a very interesting statement worthy of discussion. Right um, on that. Student debt is not their department. Uh, does anyone remember Tom Lehrer who wrote this wonderful song about Vernon von Braun? It's not my department, says college and faculties, right? It's not good enough, right? And I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, the only faculty members rarely considering, uh, consider uh, if a product they're selling is worth money. Now, I can't answer that. I don't know. And I'm certainly not going to get into debate about it, but it is important. What is to be done? Well, first of all, I, unlike you, feel as though uh, see the crisis coming because of the gap here, of the gaps here that I have talked about. Uh, I don't think the current system can be sustained. And because I'm Jewish and I have an apocalyptic mind, <laughs> uh, when the end comes, I want you to remember, I said this was going to happen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you understand people live very comfortably until the Nazis come. Well, I, in fact, have that mindset. I'm a very happy person because I wake up every morning glad to be alive. But I'm also aware of how uh, a dangerous situation cannot be seen in advance. That's one of the joys of being a historian and being interested in genocide, war, and revolution. You know, it does feed into my uh, thinking um, on this. Well, um, spending like there is no tomorrow is irresponsible. Um, the cost cannot be borne by increasing tuition. I think that's not going to work down the road. I've thought a lot about what can be done, and the best suggestion that I've read about, of oh, interest, I got five minutes on this one, <laughs> is um, the system has to change. And so I think in these larger uh, patterns of what has to be done. The one solution that I've liked, and I think that we need to institute this in some kind of general way, although in this economy, and given the nature of American politics, it wouldn't be likely, is in effect, come to school, right? Um, you will uh, have a debt, but if you are willing, this is an old idea, but one which seems to be very fruitful, but if you will devote two years of your life to something worthwhile for the community, which Lord knows needs it, right? Then uh, the United States government will somehow forgive your debt and you'll come out scot-free after a term of service. And you've heard these arguments before, but now I think that they have to be applied directly to getting you out of debt, because the two years that you might spend doing some good work, right, and helping other people in the United States or abroad, um, it would be wonderful that you could be out of debt, because so many people in this country are going to die buried with their debt, right? Either by natural causes or because their parents killed them. <laughs> you understand? I'm not making this up. You know, these are all possibilities uh, as to in terms of what might happen. And it seems to me, and I speak here to my colleagues who are not here, so to me, I can say anything I please. Um, the, um, the we as a faculty, as an institution, have to take your debt more seriously, right? Because you're supporting us. <laughs> and if we don't do this properly and look at our product and look at things that we might do to make your life better, right? 
and show that we are on your side, then we're not doing our duty. And maybe Mr. Schmancer is right in saying uh, that this is a moral issue of which we who teach and don't think about tomorrow have to be made a part. Okay, so I'll stop there now that I've antagonized everyone. Can I have a Yes. Okay. You, you get first. You get first. Okay. Just real briefly, when, when you first started, I thought I was going to disagree with you. I agree with almost everything. I'll buy you a bunch of candy. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I don't have a problem with student loans. I mean, in reality, my parents um, grew up on very small farms in the mountains of Appalachia and Virginia. They would have never been able to uh, go to school without some kind of opportunity to pay for them. And so I think if you make a wise investment, it's a worthwhile investment. And I do think that it, it allows some people who wouldn't have any other opportunity to attend school to attend school. I guess the question is, um, in lieu of student loans, I think we would agree that we want to give air, air people the opportunity to provide to, to give themselves an education so in lieu of, without the student loan program and what, what would the alternative be, I guess. Okay. I'm still struggling with these things, you know. Yeah. I am just so absolutely appalled. I also, I share one thing coming which means that we come together along well. My father was a junk man, and I grew up in junkyards in Providence, Rhode Island. And a situation like that I see right here, remember I got a PhD and no debt. Man, I want to go back to that somehow for you, you know, because it's not right. It, it, it's just something terribly wrong here in this. But I, I'm not glad to find somebody who at least understands that they, you know, that in those days you could get through without all the information. But, but I don't think my parents could have, they didn't get a college. They could have afforded it. Neither did mine. Yeah, but they couldn't afford it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, they could have been forced to get If they had an opportunity to borrow money, go to school, they may have been able to. Right. I'm, I'm very, I couldn't be more proud of my parents. I'm as proud of my parents as anybody yeah. can be. Don wants, I'm not saying that they necessarily should have or anything like that. I'm just saying that I think it does offer some opportunity. We should keep that. Uh, that's fine. I, I don't know if Sharon you're going to go on yeah. this, but one of the things that we haven't talked about, which may not be the place, is that you know the emphasis on four year education and, and the lack of uh, trade education. Um, living in northern Maine, trade education, trade schools were still a very important uh, uh, place that, and it wasn't that, uh, you know, uh, kids weren't getting good grades were being shunted over there either. It was being extolled as a virtuous thing to learn how to be an electrician or a plumber or a craftsman of all of any kind. And hell, those people were actually getting jobs, unlike the, some of the kids who were going to four year uh, schools. Uh, so. Um, we have a, we have a piece of education that we don't talk about very much because we don't have it very well developed, quite frankly. But another, you know, to uh, Art and get some moral questions is that I, you know, despite the, the the issues and a couple of things that you might be interested to hear is that uh, despite the uh, increase in uh, the cost of education here at TU, for instance, there has been a 188 percent increase over the past eight years in people applying to DU. Okay, so that tells you that students are still, despite knowing what the issues are, are saying it's worth the, the debt process. But Dee was also acutely aware that, that only 2.5% of families could afford, can afford the $45,000 a year price tag, so that DU has to then try to figure out, like any school, and especially a school that doesn't have a huge endowment. We're not talking about my old alma mater, Harvard, who has an endowment as big as some countries. We have a very, we, DU operates on about a $400 million budget with a tiny, tiny margin of error. It is tuition driven, and the money goes to well, it's, it's true that the administrators, the most of it still goes to us, part. Uh, and last year, I think we hired 162 new faculty, and DU has one of the lowest ratios, a 9 to 1 student ratio. And it's lower than most universities, and certainly lower than, you know, BU and others. Hmm? I'm, I'm talking about the ratio between faculty and students is one of the lowest in the United States. So these are, these are you know, these are, I'm just putting, putting out the, these plays the cost of a student saying, okay, I know how expensive this is going to be, or maybe I don't really, uh, and yet it's still making the decision, curiously enough, right, we have to say it's almost curious, 
say, gee, uh, we, we, no matter how, um, and you know, we've talked about, I think, Chris, I think last year we talked about the provost and the chancellor were here saying, you know, when we went over a $1,000 credit, I thought, well, that's a psychological barrier. That's going to be problematic. Uh, it's also problematic that then, then you all, you as consumers, start thinking of this as a business, right? You're the consumer and we're offering a product, which obviously I can tell in the classroom sort of changes the relationship, doesn't it? It starts to be less of me providing an education than, uh, than you know, uh, cranking up widgets that you can then turn into dollars. So, um, all right, let's. I'm just like, and perhaps people are like, we're not so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But um, just thinking, like, how much do you think that increasing the tuition are based on increasing the, like, the regular income of people? It's just inflation changing with time. It's like, I fully admit ignorance is pretty much all financial aspects of this regard. Do you think that, like, that has a big factor in these increases? And perhaps maybe it be, like, it could be a little better adjusted? Like, it could be a little better adjusted? Like, like, like on the bank, yeah. I say people are making more money. Obviously, I can start charging more to pay back loans. Mm -hmm. like, well, I have um, I served as an administrator in uh, both a private institution and a public institution, and I can tell you that um, in both places I've seen the numbers. And it's not like, well, we can raise the tuition, so let's do. It's more of a these are the costs to operate, and you know how do we break even? What kind of expenses? And I think most recently in Florida, where we had a, um, you know, a 10% budget cut during the recession. A 10% budget cut, you look at the, you look at the budget, and 98% of the budget is payroll. So that means people have to be fired. You know, and so there were a lot of layoffs um, and uh, cut to the to the bare bones. And things like, you know, your loan officers. We had student loan officers at the university. Those count as administrators, okay? These are people that help the students get their loans. And we have to fire some of them, okay? So we have situations where students stand in line longer. You know, you do get to see your loan officer eventually, okay? But it takes a long time. Advising hours, we had lines two hours long to see an advisor, okay? But this is what we had to do because our state budget was state budget and at a state university, the tuition goes to the state and then the state gives the school the money to operate. We don't have the power at a state university to set the tuition rate, or at least not in Florida, that was set by the legislature. So it's not like we could just increase tuition. The students would have loved to have paid an extra five dollars and not have to wait two hours to see an advisor. Okay, but they, that wasn't an option. You know, so I would say from my experience, this, the uh, public and uh, not-for-profit private universities operate at very slim margins and really operate very efficiently. And I've seen a lot of efficiency here at the school. Yeah, I think public institutions are becoming privatized. Yeah, basically. yeah, there are. I mean, their smaller and smaller percentages are paid for by the state aid. Mm -hmm. Right. Since I, I know, we're, since we're, can you roll? I know we'd like to ask more questions of, uh, of our students. Do you mind waiting until because we got? I was going to say, I hope you can have your notes for tonight's talk. Uh, no, uh, but I want to give Sharon the opportunity to yeah. give a talk, uh, give her piece, and then we can open up and have questions and. Um, well, I, I often go last because I can. Um, I, get, I have some handouts here that. I thought you might be interested, and I'm going to take the contrary. I think there's not enough student debt. Okay, how's that? Not uh, only is there not a crisis, but as as a uh, I came from a public university in Miami before I came here, and uh, what I'm passing out to for you is that the very first sheet is your change of earnings with the level of education you receive. To show, to reinforce Kelly's comment that it is an investment, that if you make wisely, it's going to repay itself, and it's definitely one worth making. And the rest of the pages are information that is primarily from the first. The first page is from Colorado State 
um, press release, Attorney General, and uh, a $4.5 million settlement with Westwood College here in Colorado, which is a for-profit institution. So there were a lot of questions about what's happening in the for-profit institution world. Just uh, yesterday, no, last week, January 18th, the University of Phoenix president is retiring. His pension will be $5 million. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> special retirement, special retirement bonus of five million dollars, and a monthly pension of seventy thousand dollars. Okay. So, um, okay, that's a for-profit institution. Are there more of those handouts? Okay. Oh, no. The next page, a headline from the Chronicle of Higher Education from just today. Um, an arm of the World Bank. Invest 150 million dollars in Laureate Education. Laureate Education is another for-profit institution. It has universities in um, 65 universities in 29 countries, I think. Okay. The, the next the next set of pages are all the copies out of the Senate report that was released last summer, where a, uh, a senator, well, you can probably remember the name. Um, the senator, one of the senators asked the Government Accountability Office to investigate the for-profit education world. And so the for-profit education world, 86% of the dollars they receive are federal dollars. Um, only 13% from private sources. What are the consequences to students? The share of student bar rate by sector, 96% uh, of students at for-profit colleges borrow, okay, versus only 48% of four-year public schools. The next one, the three-year default rate. In 2008, within three years, 22% of students at for-profit schools had defaulted only 6.8% at public universities. That's lower than Oregon, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, the completion rates. We talked about how it's only an investment if you finish buying it, right? If you graduate, if you don't graduate, you haven't made the investment. So what's happening in the for-profit education world is the students aren't finishing their degree. Institutional loans, okay, so this is another thing. There is an accountability rule. One of the accountability rules is that universities can have no more than 90% of their revenues from the federal government. 10% has to be from private sources. Well, if you have a, if you have your tuition, then someone asked the question, are tuition set equal to the loan availability? And the evidence suggests that at for-profit institutions, it is. That if you can borrow a maximum of $7,500 a year, magically, tuition at a for-profit institution is $7,500 a year. Okay. And, but that would make 100% of their revenue coming from federal dollars. So they have to increase that so that they get at least 10% from private dollars. But you can't afford to pay that. Well, that's okay, they'll loan you that. So they have private dollars. Or they give you a scholarship, but here's something. Scholarship money doesn't count if it comes from them. And so what they do is they sponsor institutions. They sponsor organizations. Okay. So I serve on a uh, national corporate advisory board for a large organization that every time I go to a meeting, I think, oh, I have to resign. I can't be associated with it. But if I resign, I can't change it, right? So I'm poor. Do I stay and try to change it, or do I resign? They have a, an agreement with a for-profit university where the for-profit university is a headline sponsor at a value of $100,000 a year. And the way they pay their sponsorship is by tuition dollars. So they give scholarships to the organization that the organization turns around and gives to the students that attend that institution. Well, that helps them bump up that 10% number because the scholarships aren't coming from them, they're coming from this national organization. 
So there's all kinds of games out there that are being played in the whole profit industry. So when you hear about, you know, doing some more, you know, you can go through and you can see there's, I like, picked out graphs and, and numbers that you might want to see, and they're all from the Senate report. It's no original research. I just, just copy. Unlike Kelly, who <laughs> cranked all the numbers himself. But I know that this is an issue because I, I do, uh, I did serve as the chair of the Financial Literacy Committee for the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants, a 19,000 member organization. And I received calls from reporters looking for stories. And they would always call me. They wanted to do a story on a student that's in terrible shape. You're at a university. You must know a student who's just drowning in his credit card debt. They wanted to do a credit card debt story. Okay? And I teach accounting. I'm sorry, my students don't get drowned in credit cards. You know, they can figure they can do the math. You know? and, and but the reporters are looking for those anecdotes to to make these stories interesting. And so as you said, what they do is they, they talk about the run-up in student debt. They talk about the run-up in the default rate. And I'm so happy when you put up the, the default rates and show the default rates up in 20, 22% in 1989, 1990. 22% default rate. Today we're at 9%. But in 2005, we were only at 46 so they show graphs from 2005 to 2013. Our default rate has gone from 4.6% to 9.1%. We've got the crisis, okay? Not showing that, you know, in 89, or 90, 91, rather, 91, during that last recession, I know there was a recession back then. My brother had a business that he had to close down in 93, that we had default rates of 22%. But they, they break off that side of the graph and just show you the last four years, and then they give you the anecdote. And the anecdote is almost always a student who went to one of those for profit schools. And the for profit schools broke the students in, they drained them of their financial aid, and then, well, they never probably should have been here in the first place, so it's not, not surprising that they don't complete. And those are the stories that we have to worry about. The other side of the story that we're not hearing about is that 31% of the student loans out there are being held by the top 20% income class in the country. Because the top 20% know the student loan is a good deal. When you go borrow, when you, when you, I come off going to college without a student loan. And it paid off. <clears throat> And I have this argument all the time with students that not here, fortunately, here at University of Denver, we are, it's, it's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. One of the first numbers I ask for coming in as an administrator is what is my retention rate? What's my six year completion rate? Okay. Are our students staying or are they finishing? Those were the metrics that I watched daily at my last institution because it was a public school. Okay. And we were trying to hit 60% completion. I was dealing with a very low income class population, students coming in, working two jobs, trying to pay their tuition. And I said, why don't you take out a loan? And they said, oh, I don't want to get in debt. It's like, take out a loan, finish school. You know, you're an economic student. I can promise you're going to get a job. You know, and you can pay off that loan, but just finish school. But it was such a hard argument to make to the students because they came from very conservative families that felt that taking out a loan was something they should do. And so I was always arguing the other side. You know, student loans are good things. They should be made available. We do have to, though, if you want to take on a mission, I would say help educate those that are prey to the for-profit institutions. Help go out to the communities for students who don't have parents that went to school, who don't have siblings in school, who don't know the difference between earning a degree online from some school that is owned from by investors on Wall Street versus a school that where the faculty and the administrators are dedicated to making sure the students finish and earn a degree. It makes a huge difference. And as you said, what the degree is worth in the end, even if they do complete, it's a completely different story. And so that was one of the things I took on as my private mission. I can tell you why the students I dealt with in South Florida ended up at the for-profit schools. They ended up at the for-profit schools because they couldn't find a path to 
other schools. It's finding a path. How do they get to better schools? They didn't do very well in the SAT scores. They didn't do very well in the ACT. They didn't see a path to a school like a university vendor. Uh, my job is I try to educate students. Community college doesn't have to take you. You get a high school degree, community college is open after. You go to community college with one year of good grades, any university will take you. They don't need an SAT score, an ACT score. A ACT scores and SAT scores are used for freshman admission for a university to judge your likelihood of success in college. If you can put in a year at a community college and show that you can succeed at college, the University of Denver takes you to open arms. Any of these universities take you to open arms. But getting that message out to our high school students and uh, keeping them away from the schools that are for-profit schools that don't care whether they have an ACT or ACT is a private mission I can run to try to make uh, our student loan issues not become I, I will note that there's a positive note on, on the retirement of the president of Phoenix. Uh, he gets 70000 a month, but he is 92. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he made seven, seven million base salary before he retired. So. <laughs> this is true. Uh, now, it, it, what may be more expensive is they're going to cover all his dental and medical care. <laughs> well, so, until he dies. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, I had a question for uh, Dr. Hart. Um, my question was, what do you think about the movement towards co-ops as an answer to the debt crisis in the education system? You have to explain to me what, how that works. Co-operative. Um, like, yeah, co-operative, like how they have business models that are co-ops that are owned by the workers and the movement forward. I, I, I follow that. Um, obviously, I'm very concerned with the reason why uh, colleges and universities are going to be so expensive nowadays. And so um, I would support movements which, in effect, cut out um, a, a great deal of what I see as waste. We have different views on that. You see the system is efficient. I think there is plenty of people uh, who are I think that universities and colleges are extraordinarily inefficient in terms of um, everything from administrative costs to uh, allocation of faculty time. Um, I have very strong feelings, which I will go into detail, about, about the importance of teaching, uh, because, you know, for better or for worse, when you have faculty members who don't teach, uh, then you have to pay for adjuncts and it all costs money. So uh, we could have a fight over that, uh, or not going, because I agree with much of what you said in particular. I'm a full college uh, front, but um, my goodness, uh, I've been at this school for many years, and there is a great deal of inefficiency that I see all around and in academia in general. Um, I don't think it's a very efficient system. I doubt whether many companies can survive with these because of the physical models. So, yes, I like the idea. But I have not been talking about this because I don't know what's going to be I've got five questions for everybody. But I think what just came to my head is that. You talked about you taught accounting. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there's a big degree of variation in what you're getting a degree in? Because we're all getting a degree in, some might be security studies, some might be, but for the most part, we maybe want to do humanitarian work, which is going to cost, you know, we're going to make, what, $30,000 a year? <laughs> and that's less than what we're paying to go to school. And I get it spread out over a long time. Like, do you think it's a big difference in I what you go to school for? And I do. What are your feelings on that? Personally, okay. So here's my personal story. Uh, my daughter was a National Merit Scholar. Okay. University of Florida pays Florida State residents that are National Merit Scholars to go to school there. Okay. They want to keep them in state. Okay. She would have made twenty five thousand dollars over four years if she went to the University of Florida. Okay, pocketed in her pocket. Okay. And they, they do it a variety of ways, but it's a combination of the bright teacher scholarship being paid back and the you know, research and all that sort of thing. So she would have made $25,000. She got into the University of Chicago. She went to the University of Chicago instead. She also got into Georgetown. She wanted to go to the Foreign Relations School at Georgetown. 
or she went to go to the University of Chicago. Both schools, I'm writing check $50,000 a year, but she could have stayed in the state and been paid $25,000. I said, you know what? I said, you want to go to Chicago and study something where you use math or science, I'll pay the $50,000 a year. You want to go to Georgetown and study international relations, you're on your own. If you want to do international relations, you just say, in stay <laughs> and, and have them pay you. Because I can tell you, we, went, we did the college tour through New England, and I can tell you 90% of the, the recent alumni giving us the college tours on college campuses were international relations majors as undergraduates who didn't get a job, and so the university hired them to be tour guides for incoming students. <laughs> okay, so I know I'm speaking to an audience here that might not be wanting to hear this, but I think that you have to you know, go into this with open eyes. Okay, so short story. I wrote checks for $50,000 a year for my daughter. She went to the University of Chicago, majored in economics, got hired by a consulting firm, switched over to um, hedge funds. She's making more money than me, and she's 25 years old. Okay. It paid off. Okay. But that's because it's something that is not fun. She didn't want to do it. Okay. She really didn't want to do it. Uh, she had to navigate around. She was, uh, you know, trying to compete with the, the Hong Kong math club that studied on the, the, the university second floor of the library, with the Singapore math club that studied, you know, they're all studying economics. 25% of the students in Chicago major in economics. Singapore math club's on the sixth floor, and they have the youngest member of the club running between the two of them, checking to make sure that they're getting the same answers on their homework. Okay. And those are the kinds of kids that she's competing with in class. And that's why not everybody wants to do it. And that's why the people who get through it end up getting good salaries and making good money. So there it is. I, you know, in my mind, you know, the value of the degree, you, uh, uh, you mentioned plumbing, electricians. You know, plumbers and electricians make more money than a lot of students who study the wise. Yeah, but they might not have the same quality of life on the line. I'm going to add to that. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any question that depending on what you make, your energy starting salaries are different. Mm -hmm. um, my ideal education for what I would like for my kids is for them to get a good liberal arts undergraduate education <laughs> and to find out what their chosen <laughs> profession is and then to go to graduate school and get trained for that. That, that being said, um, I mean, there's no question that, you know, if you major in engineering or math or um, accounting also, um, that like starting salaries, some finance um, are going to be a lot higher, but I know what I want. Like, I think ideally everyone, and this is more expensive, right? You ain't have to more or more to do that. But ideally what you'd want to do, because I think the, a good liberal arts education is uh, critical in becoming not only, uh, I think it makes you a better professional no matter what you're doing, but at the same time, one would really need to go to graduate school to get some specific training in whatever area they want to work. And I think in international relations would be a good example of that. Um, um, I think you can get a good liberal arts background in international relations, but I know that to some of these dream jobs you can probably have are, are going to require training beyond undergraduate school. Uh, Claude, I, yeah, I just thought I might put you know, you know word for studying international relations. You know. Now, your daughter, I mean, first of all, I just want to congratulate you. Yeah, thank you. She works in a hedge fund. I mean, that's wonderful. Really, be a very positive. She would not rather be doing what you did. I, I'm, I'm sure she. But, yeah. I'm sure she might. Yeah. I'm sure working on a hedge fund is terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm good for her. But let me just say that we track what these careers, these international uh, relations careers, will lead to, and our view is that what we offer here is the right education to get a job and to, frankly, with ease pay back the, uh, the, student, the student loans. So one of the reasons we have a lot of administrators, like right over there with Ray Ann, she has seven of them. They're all administrators, by the way. So they help people find jobs. 
all of us, I think, have a duty to help people find jobs. I've done my part directly with students to help people find jobs. Often the problem is finding that first job. Once you get that first job, I think we prepare you very well, not only for that first run on the ladder that you necessarily have with your white knuckles, but we prepare you for a full, full career. Like I'm sure your daughter will be in hedge funds until she's 50. I'm not sure about um, that. Yeah. <laughs> think either am I. But I do believe that these jobs in international studies, uh, where whether you're in NGOs, by the way, I know people are working in, in NGOs, people are working in Catholic Relief, been there for many years, have had a good good standard of living doing this. It can be done. You should not feel that going into the Catholic Relief Service dooms you to a life of poverty. It doesn't. So the real issue is uh, you know, this question of investment, which I think is so so well put. I mean, what are you investing in? What is the outcome? We work very hard to get you launched in a career. I mean, Ray Ann, that's what her people do. Within 12 months, 94% of people get into something related to what they wanted to get into, if not what they exactly wanted to get into. We need to keep monitoring that. For example, we had a, a group of students return yesterday, or come to my office yesterday, to give me a debrief on what was called Washington Connections. In fact, there was going to be another one called New York Connections. And the message they came back with, very interesting, the message they came back with was, we need more skills courses. We need more quant, more statistics. We need writing courses. Too often people around here write 20 page uh, uh, memos. I was in the US Foreign Service for 30 years. I never wrote anything longer than two pages. You know why? Because no one can read more than a page and a half. So, so um, one, of the, one of the points was we need more writing skills, we need more quant skills, we need more statistics, we need to learn uh, some of this computer stuff that's you know, just revolutionized uh, the area of geography. So I sat with uh, Mark Rhodes today. What can we do? How can we get some of these things uh, moved ahead? What, how can we do something in the spring? We're constantly sort of looking at the market out there. So in some ways, that sounds like we're a trade school, and in some, way, in some respects we are. But we're also trying to make sure you're educated, because this is not just about what you do at 25. Oh, well, congratulations to your daughter. It's a great job. It's not just what you do at 25. It's what you do at 35, 45, 55, or even whatever. So um, we track this. This is very important. And I can't guarantee a good career, but I can guarantee that you will have the basis here for a good career. I imagine that. that, that a strong ground in local arts is a part of that degree program. And I think, uh, I mean, just, I mean, I, I can understand exactly what you're saying. The problem with the hard parts getting your foot in the door because that liberal arts education gives you the, the communication skills, all these various skills that are going to be, help you be successful. What these the Washington Connections people, students who went to Washington for a week and a half came back and said, you know, we realized you can't do it with just liberal arts. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a liberal arts grad myself. I mean, up in, in Maine, I uh, went to liberal arts school. But you can't just do it because you need these skills. Yeah. You need to drill down on these issues. The standard now is, is, ma is a master's. That's the standard. Right. For me, it was a, a BA uh, when I went to school. Now it's a master's. So I think we can do that. So I mean, we can have a, a whole other discussion about what it you know worth. I mean, I, I can guarantee my my son's sixth grade teacher does not make the same salary as Kate me. And so we make we have make made choices about what we value in this culture, like it or not. Um, when I went to law school, uh, uh, some people went off to uh, immediately off the six-figure Wall Street and New York jobs, and others uh, went into poverty law, uh, making thirty thousand uh, a year. We had the same debt load, by the way, and but we went into it with eyes wide open, realizing that was the game plan that we we had chosen. Right. So it's uh, it. Uh, trying to get some kind of equity, and there's a whole other discussion trying to figure out what is kind of constitutes equity in, in work of what people are doing out there. So uh, 
if you would come back at some point and tell me how to get either Peyton Manning to be earning like six straight teacher salary <laughs> and have him still play football or have her salary be his equivalent, then we can have, I think, that's an interesting discussion. But I think that's the point. You have to go in eyes wide open. Oh, eyes wide open. And, and, and eyes wide open does include where you earn your degree and the likely to live in yeah. you know, a, a being placed from the school that you're at. Okay. We have a past time, but I want to make sure we have a um, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions about um, the function of education in a society being laid on this conversation and every conversation about student debt. Um, and that assumption is that education is to get young people jobs. This is not true. Um, that is one of the functions, uh, but another part of it is to create good citizens, good human beings, people who can think critically about the, re about the realities they're in and change for the better. Um, and so if we have everyone going into an accounting degree and a firm, we're going to end up with too many accountants to do all the the accounting degree actually do, and nobody to actually like take care of I'm issues. not saying it's everybody that's but, <laughs> but that's that's the but that's the what what the consequence of this kind of thinking of we'll just go into something that will make you lots of money. Um, that our society puts on our young people who don't know any better because in high school they're never taught anything about accounting or the world. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, I think yeah, I think a lot of your generation has been told follow your dreams, you know, right. find your passion, right. do what you love. Mm -hmm. That's all good as long as you're doing it with eyes open. Right. Yeah, and so, and so you know, that, that's that's you know, my daughter may end up going to graduate school and going to foreign relations. That's fine, but it wasn't going to be on my dime. Right. Yeah. Totally so, okay. so I think that that's. I, I agree with that you. The, yeah. the eyes wide open thing is also about like having our eyes shut in high school, um, and a lot of the problems that come out of college are really problems that started in K twelve school. Um, and so I wanted to ask actually a question, or really a question, because I mean I have a lot to say. But who you you said that the government profits off of uh, student loans to the tune of thirty-two billion dollars. I thought I heard. That's right. Um, and your question was, what should we do instead of student loans? <laughs> no, where that's, does that money go? No, like, uh, that, uh, that's, that's no. The question. Who makes it? Where does that money go? Okay. Well, first of all, I agree with you wholeheartedly about there's a tremendous value to education that goes beyond um, career. I absolutely believe it makes every citizen first of all. Secondly, um, what I was raising the issue of is that I like the fact that there's student loans out there because it, it allows people to go to school but, and get education that otherwise won't be able to. So that was the point I was making. And then my the follow-up was, if you don't want there to be student loan debt, what is the alternative? So that was the question. Okay, so um, I mean $32 billion isn't a lot of money. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's not. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, I would love to have started a few billion. So it would be a lot of money to me, but for the federal government, it's not that much money. I mean, it's basically zero. Um, so, uh, uh, but the, the, I wanted to make sure you were clear that the point I was making is I'm glad there's students there, right? Because I'm glad that people who are would have an opportunity to afford to go to college, have this mechanism for where they can afford to go to college and they would have one. And my question was then, if we're so upset about the issue, yeah, and I am upset about some of the issues, I'm concerned about some of the issues, if we're not going to have state labs, then what's going to be our alternative? That, that's, a, that's an alternative that we should bring in. Of course, there's a pain. We're, there's we're no free. free. But that's all right. Yeah. There, there's no free. It's taxpayer funded. Right. The question, though, was where, where is that 32 million dollars? Where's it coming from? No, where's okay, it going? He, he where said that before collection agency that's, expenses. And, no, and but, but actually, but even that, well, even if, if that were the case, it's basically zero. I mean, that'll buy one B1 bomb. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand your question. What, what's your question? The question was where, where is these, like where does that money go then after the, the government profits thirty three or whatever it is after it sees like where, it's where it's it's the holes in some other parts of the yeah, it's just it's just, just, it's, just, just it's added as a negative number in the budget. Okay, okay. So it doesn't stay in the part of that. No, it's 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 just added as a negative number in the budget. Yeah. Just, a, just, no, just like a, a tax collection. I'm, 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 I'm,
things is there is now a thriving industry uh, which is infiltrated into your city and United States and now getting students who could go to less expensive schools abroad. Canadian universities are doing it. England is doing it. I know a lot of people in each kind of line of work that can get a wonderful education on the steps. The University of British Columbia is a lot less than the US. And so we have to look at uh, what we are doing now at the School of International Studies and International Competitive environment is going to become more and more of an issue as we go on. So we look at uh, why Mexican tomatoes are cheaper and better in Florida tomatoes. And uh, you know, this is going to be part of the equation as uh, more and more people find cheaper alternatives in other countries. And I see this coming too. I know some of the people who are doing very well in selling American students on the ideas of study abroad in the larger sense, not just the, not just the semester. Of I have to balance that part with the number of students who are coming to the United States oh, that's true. to get one hell of an education and taking it back and, and profit the, uh, the, 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 the process. In fact, one of the, I have to say, uh, and, and Chris knows this, so we wound up, the EU wound up in a little bit of a financial crisis because of a very small shortfall of the number of students who wound up actually registering this year because we're under such a time small profit margin. 26 of those students were foreign students who, well, let me put it bluntly, who faked their foreign language exam, got here, we retested them and said, you can't be here, you have to go and study for a while. So we lost 26 undergraduate tuitions, which for a school like BU, you might not, that's a huge amount of, of money. But the, the, the amount, the report that I read and got reports from was the number, the amount of recruiting of foreign students in the United States because everybody out there also values, hugely values, a U.S. Uh, both undergraduate and graduate degrees. Anyone so I'm sure that there's students, U.S. students, like I have friends who couldn't get into medical school for, for lots of reasons, not least really financial, and wound up going to Grenada or someplace yeah. like that, right? Uh, and it was problematic, but eventually they're operating as MDs and they figured this process uh, out. So I think there's an, an the value of a, a U.S. education is still uh, is still very high in the minds of uh, the rest of the planet. So um, I think we need to take one more question. One more question. Oh, no, she's she's been bursting. Two more questions. Okay, I'm really looking for a silver lining here. Is there any way that we, is there any good thing about this? And the only thing that comes to mind for me personally is what about working for the government? And yes, and what is that, is that, I mean, I know it's obviously true, but is it a likely possible uh, solution? There are, there are ways of repaying your debt by working, and there are several payment options, even if you're not working for the government. So there is a, um, a percentage of income type of repayment plan that was just reduced from 25 years to 20 years where you make a payment based on how much you're earning, the percentage of how much you're earning. I think it's 10% of what you earn. So 10% of what you earn is not bad. That's what people say that you should save for retirement. But 10% of what you earn uh, is your maximum payment. And you pay that for 20 years, and then the rest of your debt is forgiven. Uh, so there are uh, repayment plans like this out there. I think a lot of, yeah. one of the problems is that um, a lot of the people who are doing the underlying, they're not familiar with all the documents that are available to them. So um, I think the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education is starting to do a much better job of educating people, both before they borrow and once they get into trouble about what their options are. And I think a lot of universities are doing that, that as well. And so if there's a silver lining, I mean, uh, to me there's no silver lining, the facts are what they are, and but, um, one of the things we can take away from this is that, I mean, there's certainly a need to educate people on both sides, both in retail and repayment and those who are borrowing. You get last one. Yes. <laughs> Just a quick comment. It'll there is a 10 year plan now if you work for the state, federal, local, or NGO not affiliated with the uh, a religious affiliation. 10 years on 120 straight payments. After that, they forgive the rest of your loan, which is you know. Um, and I just wanted to comment that I think. We're sort of talking about two separate, it's like related but two separate issues. And I think our biggest concern is not so much the fact that we have to take out debt, because I don't think that we all deserve a free education. Nothing in life is free. 
somebody doesn't have to pay for it, it would be nice to be a bit more accessible. But we could be France and taxing people at 90%. Nobody here is going to want that. But I think our biggest our biggest concern is that we're, we're taking out mortgages. When I, when I look at it, I'm thinking, I'm taking out a mortgage, and I understand that it's an investment, but from what I see is that we're discouraging so many more people who could feasibly take on some student debt because they're too afraid to take on a mortgage. I'm one of those. I had to reapply because I was like, 100 Gs, I could buy a house in Alabama, but I could buy a house. <laughs> I think quite a few people, especially from what I see in DU and the whole campus, minorities. There's like five of us. And so there it's it's extremely discouraging knowing that the only way you can get an education is if you take out a mortgage that may or may not pay off, depending on what you're doing. But we still wonder why is it we're paying fifty thousand dollars when a generation ago people could work through college that's not feasible anymore it's just not you can't fathom doing that in a certain amount unless you're going to take 15 years to do so and i think that's the concern i don't mind taking out a student loan because i do see it as an investment i just worry about taking out a mortgage on that chair on that cheerful note i have to say i i'm despondent when as soon as you say taking out a mortgage which i agree with Chris. But I'm on my fifth mortgage. I'm 60, which means I will not fulfill the American dream. I will be long dead before my mortgage is paid off. So the American dream of owning a house is not something I will realize. So I'm sympathetic, but being right? And having access to education. And I think it's more of a question of what's going on in our country as a society, as opposed to just the education system. There's just so many more, it's such a bigger issue than that. Well, I think, um, one thing that has to, and that's to all in your decision calculus about what decisions you make, Absolutely. about how much money you want to borrow, right? You could go to state you and borrow less money, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that it's not worth it to pay private school education. You might, for example, um, um, it, it might be a much better program that you think is worth the extra money, or you might get a better job because of it. But that should all enter the decision calculus because you don't have to have borrow one hundred thousand dollars to get have, an education. When you have community colleges cut drastically cutting budgets because the budget has been cut, you're eliminating the access of education to those who can only afford to do so through those. No, no, I'm not trying to get angry. I'm not. I'm not it's the whole situation. Okay, it's not just. So can, we can yeah. continue. Yeah. So mm -hmm. before uh, two, uh, uh, my <laughs> announcements are two next programs. But before I do that, the panelists, thank the panelists very much for the time. <laughs>